there's equal benefit in revisiting the past. Now we have all this crazy shit, whether it's AI or all of these amazing plugins. How do you take the old and the new and put it together and then really come up with something unique? My name is Sam. I go under the producer name of Jaws. I've been making electronic music for like 15 years and uh, now I'm here at Output. I've done songs with Skrillex, Tiesto, Diplo. I run my own record label called Bite This and uh, I've played at a couple of music festivals here and there. In 2018, I put out The Wise and the Wicked, which was like my debut album. It definitely ended up, you know, performing better than I thought it would. I was kind of like, you know what, I'm gonna go do exactly what I'm not supposed to do. And I'm not just gonna put out an album, I'm gonna put out a 23 track album and it's gonna be fucking cinematic and have all these interludes and all this really thematic, you know, kind of concept album-y stuff. So I kind of really just did that album for me. I would imagine most people watching this have heard Ghosts and stuff before, but if you haven't, uh, it's one of the most iconic dance records of all time, written by Dead Mouse, the guy with the mouse head. When you're remixing a song of that magnitude, there's a lot of, you know, self-imposed pressure or external pressure. You really can't fuck this up. I really tried to not use a lot of the original song and quote unquote, play it safe. I really almost wanted it to feel like you were hearing a completely new song for the first time, but with elements that still made it feel really familiar to you. I'll start with the stuff from the original Ghosts and stuff that I kept, which wasn't that much. Obviously, have to keep the Rob Swire vocal in there. It's been so long, I've been out of my body with you. Doesn't really sound too different. I think I processed it a little bit different than the original just because I guess I wanted to put my spin on it. And then I also did a little bit of extra processing on this top lead here that Rob does that to me is like, this is the quintessential moment of ghosts and stuff, you know, music aside. This is the part of the song that really makes the hair on your arm rise up. <laughs> Other than that, the main kind of driving force through how I wanted to approach the remix was another one of the, I think, really core elements of the song. What I wanted to do was make the song darker and more moody and much more orchestral and kind of take those strings that kind of just exist in the original and really build on them and really kind of step it up a notch. But I think it might be cool to just listen to the kind of orchestral section as a whole, which is pretty beefy. Uh, there's three different layers of uh, brass instruments. There's the original strings and then a bunch of other strings that I added in. Normally you focus so much on a drop as an electronic music producer, but honestly for me, this section right here is what I spent the most time on because it was really important to me. I will almost always, if I'm doing anything relatively orchestral, use Analog Brass and Winds. One of my favorite plugins. The thing that I love about, uh, I mean, all the output plugins that I use, but this one especially is it, it doesn't take me very long to find what I'm looking for. I really like working fast and efficient. And when I find something that just has super inspiring presets, that to me is worth its weight in gold. I'm modulating a couple of these macros. I'm automating them to change over time a little bit if we listen to it by itself.
so it, it just starts off a little bit filtered and a little bit muffled so that it doesn't just come right in. To me, the real trick was kind of figuring out how do I gradually build all these elements so at the very end it feels like this huge uh, crescendo of just all of these elements coming together and making this you know super, super epic moment. I think what would be really cool is to listen to the brass and the orchestra without the analog brass and winds, which sounds something like this. Sounds fine, but then when you add it back in. It adds so much more depth and perfectly filled in kind of like the frequency spectrum of what I thought I was missing in that section. But I guess now we can get to the part that everyone is really here for, which is the drop. The main thing that you're hearing in this drop is probably these guys right here. All of the original MIDI tracks are up here. It's all just Serum, which is my go-to. So there's three different kind of versions of the same lead sound that are happening that I, I stack together a little bit. And then there's even some more after that. But this is kind of the central focal point, which is this guy right here. I'm sure I'm not the only one who does this. I still feel like I'm giving away one of my like go-to kind of secrets here, which I, I don't really care. But um, something that I've been doing for the last couple of years, probably ever since I did the trampoline remix, I stopped writing bass leads as one note, which would make the most sense. And I started making two note chords and splitting them by enough octaves and just basically adding a ton of distortion. And the combination of all those things together is what gives it this really specific characteristic. So if you look at the MIDI here, F0 is the root note, and then it's playing a harmony of C sharp four. So it's... Which like is a fine sound on its own. And then if I play just the top, which again, is like a fine lead, but when you put them together, the magic really happens. I found if you space out the dissonant notes far enough from each other, that they actually end up being really pleasing and sound really cool. Um, if you look down at the synth group right here, I have basically the same chords as that main lead up there with, uh, I guess what I would call super saws, a group of super saws, and I, I turned them into chords, and it sounds something like this. So if I play that with the main lead. It's just a lot of really complimentary sounds all focused on supporting one central kind of idea. Not actually too unlike the orchestral section at the beginning of the song. And that's about it for the drop. There's nothing else too crazy going on in there. Um, I have this little uh, kind of fill section. And all that is, is I brought back in that kind of classic dead mouse chord progression just tucked it into the background. And then this is actually, uh, I think when I started this version of the remix, that track kind of just 
happened to be in this project still and it played on accident. And I was like, oh, this actually sounds really cool. I feel like the only other thing I haven't really touched on too much is the drums. My personal opinion, if you're not a drummer, if you don't feel confident in your drums, simpler is always going to be better. I mean, even my cymbals are just, you know, and this is every single one of my songs I've ever made. Basically just a couple different top loops that I throw together that I feel like make the song move forward and feel nice. Nothing too fancy. And then uh, over here for the verse. It's been so far, I've been walking the line on my own. More or less the same thing. I mean, I used a uh, vengeance like drum fill because again, I'm not a I'm not a drummer. I'm not a drum guy. If there's something that's already out there that fills the exact need that I'm looking for in a song, and it's a sample that I own. I don't see a problem in using it. I made a different snare, just layered two more snares together, made it a little bit more tonal and a little bit less aggressive, just because you want the vocal to be the star of this section, not the big beefy drums. And then I think the last thing that is worth talking about is right before the drop, there's this kind of big moment that happens right here. This sound should be very recognizable to you. The off sync free rate, whether it's a saw bass or a lead or whatever, you know, a lot of these uh, house songs or techno songs or whatever that are doing these crazy random LFO basses. And I'm sure that's where I got the inspiration for making a sound like this. But a lot of those songs, I feel like make it this really central focus of the record. And I was just like, you know, to go from this big orchestral section and then kind of break it down and build it back up, I knew I needed some kind of moment of like this big release. And then you can kind of like relax for a second, take a breath. So then you can be built back up for the drop. And I feel like uh, this little serum bass that I made and just, you know, did some wacky things with the LFO rate filled exactly that need. And it just allows that big orchestral section to kind of more naturally go into these uh, muted chords that kind of tease what the drop is gonna sound like. These guys right here. I'm a big believer in happy accidents and kind of letting the music kind of guide you versus trying to come in with this preconceived notion of like, I'm gonna make this kind of song today. I almost equate it to like artists who just like throw buckets of paint. They're just like letting it rip and seeing what happens. So the more tools I can have like that, the better.